Well, thank you so much, Cathy. I have particular thanks on behalf of all those from Oxford. Many, wonderfully, of our undergraduate group of 12 are here, some of them for the first time in their lives in Greece, though they are keen students of the Greek world and Greek history. And what a wonderful time, at least for us, to be here in Athens in this marvelous weather and everything you can offer to us. If I speak at this level, can you hear me at the back? Yes. Right, that's a good start. My English is rare Etonian Oxonian English, and I hope, unlike Pericles, as I will explain, this time I have a written text. Could I say that I have given various pieces of paper out, uh, and I've put my email address on the top, and for all of you who disbelieve me, rebel, have better views. I hope this will be a small contribution from Oxford towards all the ancient history done here so importantly in the real living heart, Athens. And I would also just say, on behalf of all our Oxford group, that we read so much about Greece's debt, if we can put it that way, to Europe. But this is a different paper. It is a small tribute to our debt to Greece. I'm trying to please two constituencies, the expert scholars whom I see not only in the front row, and those of you who um, are familiar to a degree with Periclean Athens. Um, I expect to speak for 55 minutes. I'll set the scene. Uh, to set the scene, slide one. Excellent. You recognize it. On an early winter's day in 431 BC, the male Athenian citizens, women, metics, and foreigners prepared to listen to the traditional funeral speech for their war dead, the first in the war with Sparta. After three days of display in public, the bones of the fallen had been carried in ten coffins of cedar wood, one for each tribe of the Athenian citizenry, to the traditional site the finest suburb of the city, where we all were this morning, where the public sepulchre stood. An eleventh coffin was brought empty, in honour of those Athenians whose bodies could not be recovered. The bones were set inside the sepulchre, and then the speaker, pre-elected for wisdom and public respect, walked up to address the crowd. In 431, he was aristocratic Pericles, son of Xanthippus, Hadrianic bust in my view. By comic poets in Athens, Pericles had been described as skinocephalos, having a head shaped like, in English, a squill, and modern scholars have sometimes inferred that he therefore had a badly shaped head. However, as a gardener, I can tell you the ancient Greek squill is a bulbous plant known for big, rounded flower bulbs. Squill-headed Pericles was round-headed and bald. He was known for wearing his military helmet, see my picture, in everyday life, not to hide a deformity, but to emphasise his military credit as someone who had been elected one of the ten generals of the city in every one of the past 15 years. Bald beneath his helmet, Pericles by now, like me, in his mid-sixties, mounted a platform and surveyed his audience. We have, I believe, slide two please, a visual companion to his speech, the attic funerary relief, of course, of one of the very horsemen who was among the dead whom Pericles had to honour. Now in Rome at the Villa Albani, it shows the Athenian cavalryman dismounting exactly in the style recommended by the Athenian Xenophon. He fixes his gaze typically on the dying warrior at his feet, who in turn returns the gaze. The fixed gaze, the encounter, frozen in a wider pattern of action, the billowing robe, the marvellous pose of the two dead warriors, and above all, the foam, form and the pose of that magnificent horse belong exactly with the style of the Parthenon frieze. The sculptor of this relief had worked in Phidias' team. In 431, he even carved, far left, not well visible, the outline of a hilly landscape behind his two warriors. The scene, surely, 
of the cavalry fighting in Attica in 431, which we know from Thucydides 2.22.2. Pericles was known already for funeral speeches, above all for his speech formally over the Athenian dead eight years earlier in the war with Samos. In spring 431, Athenians had already heard fine words of praise for their city in Euripides' masterpiece, the Medea. But Pericles was still more than the equal of Euripides. He delivered the speech, which has become the most famous of all speeches, the most imitated until our modern age. In 1863, for instance, it was a model for Abraham Lincoln in his brief Gettysburg Address, also over dead in war. In 1915, in wartime London, extracts, admittedly in translation, were displayed on the sides of London buses. Perhaps only the speech of Pope Urban to proclaim the first crusade at Clermont in mid-November 1095 is even with any reach of Pericles' funeral speech's impact. However, unlike Pope Urban, Pericles said nothing about the gods, nor even about a life after death, either as a reward for the dead or a comforting thought for their survivors. And unlike the Pope, he said nothing on killing in battle as a direct Christian route to paradise. A genial contemporary, I own of Chios, had met Pericles and published his impression in his travel memoirs. I own found him, I quote, arrogant, hard to approach, and conceited. For Hegel, centuries later, this loftiness nonetheless was a marvel. Pericles was, I quote, Zeus of the human pantheon of Athens. Yet modern writings in English, in America and Britain, about the speech now tend in Ion's direction. They call it collectivist, the expression even of totalitarian philosophy, nationalist, militarist, and embarrassingly imperialist. While for Hermann Strasburger in the 1950s, the funeral speech, I quote, has something eerie about it, precisely because it is not composed to suit its purpose. Instead of phrases of panhellenic neighborly love, says Strasburger, Pericles dwells on the real driving force of Athenian energy, the intoxicating satisfaction in one's own power, the capability and intellectual independence of one's own people, but to the rest of the world, hardness, arrogance, contempt, a magnificent hostility. In short, he concludes, revealingly for a German in the 1950s, here at last is the competitive ideal of early Greece, proving unintentionally Thucydides' contention that human nature does not change. Is that only why Pericles matters now? First, a word on our knowledge of what he said. Four centuries later, Cicero refers to written speeches, I quote, which are said to be by Pericles. But like me, Quintilian, says he agreed with all those who considered them all to be fakes. Plutarch certainly knew no written speeches. Yes, Aristotle quoted one phrase, and in my view only one, from Pericles' earlier speech of 439. Plutarch quotes another. But their knowledge of them only derives, I believe, from anecdotes in the tradition of biographers. I do not believe for one moment that Pericles circulated texts of his own speeches. In Athenian political culture, pamphlets were circulated only by the far right wing. The Periclean speeches we have are, of course, due solely to the historian Thucydides. In his unsurpassed histories, he includes those three Periclean speeches and, in outline, a fourth which lists Athens' resources and puzzles us at the start of the war. Following modern fashion, at least initially, I'll begin by pointing to several items in these speeches which are startlingly different to our own values. It is not only that so often 
They cite shame and envy as powerful human emotions and reasons for action. That is more surprising, perhaps, to British readers than to Greek members of my audience. The first item matters, but perhaps only to me. Pericles is extremely dismissive of gardens. In his final speech in Thucydides, he tells the Athenians in 430 to look on the farms they have abandoned to enemy ravaging as if they are, I quote, only a capion. The word is not a metaphor, an appendage, as our lexicons say. It is literally a little garden. And Pericles then qualifies this little garden as merely, I quote, the showy adornment of the rich. His advice here would not convince my weekly readers in the London Financial Times if their properties were ever under threat. The Athenians' priorities were different here to theirs and to mine. More seriously, Pericles is soundly imperialist. Alone of all peoples on record, he tells his Athenians, we are regarded by our subjects as, I quote, worthy to rule them. His greatest modern commentator, A.W. Gom, remarked in 1956 that this argument, worthiness, is, one, perhaps the only justification of empire, without which, said Gom, it is intolerable. He also added that Pericles is to be criticised for saying nothing of, I quote, the sense of duty, of responsibility, which imperialism should give rise to. But which Greek ever did say anything on that line? And as for worthiness to rule, did the people of, say, Thassos or Chios, all of them, really consider the Athenians were worthy? And if so, how did Pericles know? In the postmodern fashion, of course, is to subvert arguments from other evidence. But ideals do matter. And Pericles goes on to say something which I still find hard to translate. My handout, second wonder. He talks of eternal memorials, a idiom nemata, which the Athenians collectively settle, sun katoikidzusi. I cannot follow scholars who see a reference here to Athenian colonies abroad, increased though they had been by Pericles' own policies. For what then would kaka mean? Is he referring both to failed settlements and successful settlements in the funeral speech? I have to suggest a slight emendation of the text. For kakon, with no manuscript authority on my part, read kalon and translate fine and fair deeds rather than fine and fair people. Are the memorials of these fine and fair deeds physical trophies in foreign battlefields, or are they the more general memories of oral fame and glory? I prefer the latter, as Pericles had hinted at it in a fragment of the speech from 439. Yet the sense of settlement in the verb, sun katoi kidzein, makes me hesitate. The truth is, I don't know, and I don't think that scholars know yet either. Tell me over the cocktails. But one fact is certain. These memorials are not those which have proved to be eternal, despite Pericles. What we remember, of course, are the Athenians' dramas, art, thought, and, of course, Pericles and Thucydides himself. Now, unlike modern historians, fashionably post-imperial, fashionably post-colonial, trendily post-modern, I am not troubled at all by Pericles' unashamed praises of empire. When, indeed, in antiquity, were Aegean cities ever better governed than when they were members of the Athenian alliance? In 2008, when summing up our modern problems of dating Athenian inscriptions about this empire, Peter Rhodes addressed, I quote, those in our time who want to regard the Athenian empire as wicked but to follow Thucydides in regarding Pericles as virtuous, but Cleon, his successor, as vicious. But even if the post-Periclean datings now in favour for the main Athenian imperial decrees are all correct, and I very much doubt it, the downdating will not help the people whom Rhodes addresses. The imperial outlook is frankly expressed already, immovably, 
in Pericles' own funeral speech. I differ merely in not finding it remotely wicked. So there. <laughs> Above all, near the end of his speech, Pericles devotes a word, if I must, he says, to excellence in women, such as our widows. My handout, text three. Try not to be worse than your existing nature, he tells them, and do not become an object of praise or blame among men. Contrary to much modern scholarship, he is not referring simply to women's role as lamenting emotionally at funerals, including this very funeral, we are told, in 431. Nor is he saying what Stephen Tracy has recently made him say in translation, live up to your existing nature. No, Pericles is making a general point about women. He is saying that although we know women by nature are second class, they must try hard to avoid being worse. That is third class. <laughs> Members of my party, they're all bad girls, but they're not to attract praise or blame by behaving, say, like the widow of the Athenian Iscomachus some 20 years later. When she was rid of her husband, and Dossides claims, she made off with her son-in-law, ejected her own daughter, and caused a public scandal, exactly what Pericles opposes. The same wife, of course, whom Xenophon in the Economicus had praised in her earlier married life. It's a sexist speech, and it's an imperialist one, certainly to sensitive modern ears. Now, hostile reactions to it, second topic, are not only a modern response. Some 50 years after its delivery, Plato reacted with malign disgust. I refer, of course, to his Menexenus, that most puzzling dialogue in which he makes Socrates recall the very words of a funeral speech which he said had been taught to him by Pericles' celebrated mistress, or female partner, next picture please, there we have modern renderings, Aspasia, Pericles' sexual companion for at least 12 years after his divorce from his first wife. Only yesterday, Socrates is made to say, she had almost beaten the speech into me. She improvised some of it, he tells us, but other bits, he says, she had prepared previously when she had been composing the funeral speech which Pericles delivered. What is Plato doing here? No woman, least of all a foreigner like Aspasia, could ever have given an Athenian speech in public. Irony and malice are hideously in evidence, combined with impossible chronology, and then he gives an absurd funeral speech in which Plato's Aspasia speaks a tedious, turgid, feminine length on anything from Mother Attica to some muddled thinking about Athens' <clears throat> constitution and a highly tendentious version of Athenian history in the past 70 years. The ending is classic. Oh, Socrates, Menexenus replies, from what you say, Aspasia is blessed indeed. If she is capable of putting such words together, woman though she is. Plato was born a year after Pericles' death. He certainly never heard a funeral speech by the great man. What is driving this one? The fullest scholarly discussion of the Menexenus in English was by Lucinda Coventry in 1989, but she studied it only for what she described as its philosophical and rhetorical strategies. She says nothing on a less elevated source for it, Athenian comedy. The 5th century comic poet Callias had already claimed in fun that Aspasia really wrote the great man's speeches for him, as if, say, Mimi had written the later speeches of Papandreou. <laughs> Plato is taking the joke to a deeper and much more ironic level. What is Socrates calls the funeral speech is surely the one of 431, for that is the only one which survived for Plato to know word by word 50 years later. Now, the speech by Plato's Aspasia is not actually in the style of the famous Periclean speech we have, 
although many, many echoes have been claimed by zealous scholars since 1882. However, Plato explains the reason. Aspasia, he tells us, had improvised it. And she had also, wonderfully, used unused leftovers from the famous speech, pasting them together, the very words, syncholen, as if Aspasia had gone through her waste paper basket with a tube of glue, her print stick. No wonder that the speech has themes which, to admirers of Thucydides' Pericles, are quite unattested. Aspasia includes lengthy praise of the gods, as our Periclean speech conspicuously does not. She goes on and on about Athens's past history, as our Pericles does not. She gives historically absurd praises to the Athenian people for being oh so fond of mercy, though each of her examples is historically wrong. She even claims that Athens's constitution is an aristocracy. Why ever does she say this about the famous democracy? Not, surely, to suit Plato's own preference, but rather, I believe, this wicked slander was suggested to him by Thucydides' view that under aristocratic Pericles' leadership, Athenian democracy was becoming ruled by one man himself. We begin to see what prompted Plato to add this amazing parody to his attacks in other dialogues on Pericles' political record. Plato, we must infer, had indeed read Thucydides' book too. Its famous funeral speech, he found, um, used rhetoric, flattery, was completely ignorant of true philosophy, and it appalled him. So he parodied its source, claiming that it was Aspasia who had composed it and then made fun of the stupidity which typified such speeches. The Menexenus is our earliest evidence for the reception of any of Thucydides' great work, what he himself called a possession for all time. It is extremely cunning and cruel. Now, the burning question. If Thucydides is the only source of the speech we now read, is the speech more Thucydides than Pericles? Here, I cannot accept the recent careful argument of Professor Bosworth in 2000 that the speech's historicity is proven by an oddity of its general tone. The fact, Bosworth notes, that Pericles does not dwell on actual feats of the dead in battle, their deeds, unlike, say, Hyperides' funeral speech in 322. And for Bosworth, this unusual angle is explained exactly and only by the circumstances of 431. The dead then, he believes, were only the dead in Attica itself, and in his opinion, they had not been very significant in the war. So he thinks the speech matches its context in a way which no later inventor or Thucydides would have thought of risking many years later. Well, as Thucydides says, the speech does honour the first who died in the war, but contrary to Bosworth, he means, of course, all those who died in the entire first year of the war. Hence, it was delivered at the end of the military season in early winter. And the first year's dead included plenty who had died on brave and successful campaigning, whether on Egina or on the big naval campaign round Greece's southern coastline. Pericles did not evade discussing the dead's battle performance because in 431 they had achieved rather little. Instead, at the start of war, he preferred to contrast Athenian values and lifestyles with their enemies, the Spartans. Athens, of course he wants to show, is worth dying for. This concern, though untypical, is not itself proof, though, that the speech is authentic, a creation of 431 and only 431, after all, Thucydides, I suppose, might have invented it. So far as I can see, the only grounds for accepting its historicity have to lie nearer Thucydides himself, in that notorious sentence, which is the most discussed, and for me, the most mistranslated in Thucydides' entire histories. 
In his remarkable preliminary statement of method, Thucydides tells us, I quote, on the one hand, it was difficult, even for me or my informants from elsewhere, to remember through and through, notice the compound verb, the exact nature, the acre bear of what was said. I stress that, acre bear, hitting the acron exactly on the head, a demanding word for accuracy never used, incidentally, by Herodotus. But present, I remind you, in the Callias decree at Athens of 334 to 3, 434 to 3, as Thucydides matured. I could not be word perfect on the one hand, he is saying, but, and in this proud statement of method, we expect him to go on, I have nonetheless kept very close indeed. And that, on my translation, I could defend later, is exactly what he says. In winter 431, it was very easy for Thucydides to keep as close as possible to the total content of Pericles' speech. In my view, he was there himself. The young admirer, now in his late twenties, seated, I've come to believe, about four rows back, um, looking up in admiration, gazing in wonder at his political hero, a man of his own social class. Thucydides himself was of the military age and social standing to serve in the cavalry, the force which Pericles had enlarged so greatly. Thucydides had served, I believe, that very summer with some of the dead who were praised in the speech, including the very Athenian of our Albani relief that I showed. Of course, I even suspect that like later young hearers, we are told, of fine speakers in antiquity, he had even brought bits of papyrus writing paper and had a pen to hand. Nonetheless, his presentation of Pericles is special. For Martha Taylor, in her recent book on Thucydides, Pericles and the idea of Athens, the Periclean vision, I quote, is one which Thucydides repeatedly questions and discredits. Exactly the opposite is the case. Unlike all other speakers in Thucydides' histories, Pericles is never answered. The reason is that the historian looks back in veneration of the great man. In the first winter of the war, Pericles sets out what matters, Tadionta, the qualities which make Athens great and so worth dying for. And what he said matters to Thucydides and his readers because the rest of the histories will go on to show how a city-state with such uncontested ideals was then ruined by fortune and bad leadership, leading to a needless defeat. The subject of the speech is not merely Athens' power or political system, as Hornblower's large recent commentary tries vainly to persuade us. It is indeed Athens' distinctive culture, the education of Greece, including, though not specifying, its theatre, the greatest Athenian cultural export to the rest of the Greek world. By the anthropologist Marshall Salins, Thucydides recently has been accused of neglecting cultural history and failing to see that human nature will vary necessarily with the culture of distinctive social groups. The funeral speech is one of dozens of answers throughout the histories to Salin's interesting attack. Pericles, however, was only one voice. How subjective is he? For Professor Zumbrunnen in 2008, he's highly personal. His speech, I quote, is another attempt by Pericles to define the identity of his Athenians. It is not simply an expression of the identity. But as so often elsewhere, Pericles, I believe, was putting into words what his audience tacitly accepted already. He was certainly not addressing hearers with a problem of identity at all. In the past 30 years, the Athenians had lived through what we call a paradigm shift, mentally, culturally, politically, artistically. Entire ways of speaking and of thinking had changed as anything from political philosophy to political comedy or abstract mathematics 
were invented for the first time in the world, in a way unequaled until the early 20th century. The Athenians, by the 430s, were fearless innovators. There were no problems about innovation in their Greek world. Our first view of their culture in Thucydides' histories is marvellous, seen through others' eyes artfully, the Corinthians at Sparta. They say, hoi men, ge, the Athenians at least, a magnificent Thucydidean ge, neotero, neotero poie, ka epino ese oxes. They are innovative and so quick uh, to pile idea upon idea, unlike you Spartans. This innovative culture was an uncontested fact. So far from reading it uh, as somehow in need of independent one-man um, uh, definition, we need to ask, rather, what was Periclean in the totality of Athens in his age, the Periclean world? I will begin the second part of my lecture with the Periclean quality which most impressed the unspeakable Plutarch, so out of his depth in the 5th century BC. When comparing Pericles' life with that vastly inferior Roman, Fabius Cunctator, Pericles, he tells us, I quote, was so gentle to his friends. I much doubt that Pericles could ever afford to be in the Athenian democratic competitive arena. However, Plutarch does record one curiosity. Pericles, he tells us, is said to have kissed his lady Aspasia each morning on his way to work and each evening on his return. If so, he would be the first recorded person in history to have done so. <laughs> Much is written, incidentally, about Greek love nowadays, always between men, but this claim does have a place in the debate. Pericles is never linked with any sexual desire for a male. For a different impression, this is more complicated, one of the rivalries and hatreds around Pericles, I wish to point, as others I think have not fully, to the generals who were sent to lead the two expeditionary fleets sent to help Corsara in summer 433. They were delicate assignments, Pericles' idea urged by him, surely, and likely to be the prelude to a full war. We know a little only about three generals of the six sent, but it is consistent. Notably, one of the three, of course, sent with the first force is Lacedaemonius, son of Pericles' old political enemy, Cimon. But I assume his command had to be voted by the Democratic Assembly, and his choice was perhaps, in their view, a reassurance to the Spartans that the Athenians didn't yet mean full war. But who proposed him? Pericles, maliciously, or Pericles' enemies, in order to have one of their own men out on the expedition? The interesting thing is the second reinforcing force promptly sent without comment in Thucydides. Here we know it's three generals. We know in detail of two of them. One is Dracontides, a political enemy who would go on to prosecute Pericles for embezzlement, in my view, three years later, and the case, I believe, which led to the finding of Pericles, reported in 430 by Thucydides 265. And the second general? Why? Glaucon. The very Glaucon, surely, whose name is so often misprinted as Glycon, following some but not all manuscripts of Plutarch's Life of Pericles. In fact, Glaucon had also helped the prosecution of Pericles' associate Phidias, again for supposed embezzlement, in my view, four years earlier in 437. On any view, it is politically revealing that the ten generals for 433 could include at least three serious enemies of Pericles, elected nonetheless by the people. Pericles was certainly not the only voice even in military Athens. But as generals for this second force, had his bitter enemies also been voted by Pericles' opponents in the assembly? Or, as I prefer, as it was only a supporting expedition for the first one, were the remaining generals left 
to choose the leaders for the second expedition among themselves. If so, did most of the generals still in Athens combine with Pericles and agree to send his two biggest enemies on a supremely dangerous mission, which would probably result in a legal trial if it went wrong? Pericles, conspicuously, did not go out himself. <laughs> not gentle, then, but here we must return to his speech, more upbeat. In it, conspicuously, he praises the Athenians for being distinctive because, I quote, they combine daring with a prior calculation of what they are about to do. Others' boldness, Pericles remarks, rests on stupidity, and so their reasoning merely brings delay. This claim is very striking. It fits, I suggest, admirably with several Athenian decisions during Pericles' year of preeminence, parts, I believe, of a Periclean pattern. First, the Congress decree, as we know from per Plutarch Pericles, surely datable to spring 450, just at that moment when Callias, a political rival, had seized the headlines with his much-debated peace agreement, so-called, brought back from the king of Persia. In reply, we have Pericles' decree, as given by Plutarch, which orders that ambassadors at least of 50 years of age or more are to go round the Greek cities and call a summit meeting, my phrase, to discuss spending money to rebuild Athens's ground zero, the temples on the Acropolis destroyed by those sacrilegious Persians. Is it genuine? As G.T. Griffith acutely observed in 1978, Ambassadors to be aged 50 years or more are only specified on one other known occasion in all Athenian history, the Methoni Decree of 430. They are an exact detail of the Periclean era, not later, and I cannot believe they were known to a later literary forger. Like Griffith, I accept the Congress decree as genuine. As a result, Pericles is the first known politician in the world to have called for a summit meeting. It was, of course, a failure. It was not a G20 sort of failure. I believe he had never expected it fully to succeed, but he was planning it as a preliminary to his real plan, the spending of the Athenian allies' tribute on rebuilding Athens' ground zero after first establishing that the other Greeks refused to help thinking. Next, financial planning. Seriously complex topic, still complicated by that notorious papyrus decree, which, I remind you, is preserved only on a papyrus in Strasbourg, but which cites Pericles as its proposer. Against so many scholars up to 1957, I do not myself believe that this papyrus decree is a Periclean initiative of 450 BC. The fundamental study remains a brilliant one by Wilken in 1907, which all lovers of historical scholarship should, I hope, read. The papyrus he was the first to recognize preserves the commentary of a Hellenistic scholar on Demosthenes' speech 21, a brilliant insight. It is this scholar who cites the decree of Pericles dated to the archonship of Euthydemus. From, admittedly, only Diodorus, we know two Euthydemuses as year archons. One is in 450 to 49, the other 431 to naught. And with Vilken, I prefer the latter one for Pericles' reported decree. I then explain it and its clear mention of 5,000 talents as being moved within Athens, only as a decree inferred by earlier Hellenistic scholarship from the mention by Pericles of 6,000 talents in Thucydides' Book Two, promptly reduced by that reserve of 1,000 talents further defined in Book Two. Only partially preserved for us, this papyrus decree 
is not a genuine degree of 450, as often argued, which prepares the funding plan for the planned rebuilding of the Acropolis. After all, that re rebuilding did not cost anything near 5,000 talents. Nor was it a genuine Periclean proposal. Nonetheless, I do believe that in or around 449 to 8, a long-term financial proposal, surely by Pericles, was indeed adopted. The proposal to use 3,000 talents of funds from Athena's treasury and to spend it on the costs of rebuilding Ground Zero, and then to repay it in instalments from the surpluses in future years left from the contemporary continuing tribute paid by Athens' allies. And, true to my suggestion, in 434 to 3, the sum of 3,000 talents was indeed paid off in full, as scholars infer, from the Callias Decree side A, datable to that year. Complicated and abbreviated. But in short, the Athenians of the early 440s had voted history's first attested Greek debt repayment program. True to the funeral speech, it combines long-term thinking and boldness. I merely differ from previous scholars and the belief of Wade Geary that the scheme was to be very orderly and exactly specified. Specifically, throughout 15 years, 200 talents to be repaid each year. The important point, Pericles' plan was more flexible and less, I have to say, Germanic. The variable surplus of each year was to be paid back without a fixed time span, but with full trust that it would indeed be done. Trusting his Athenians, Pericles found they duly did it. Moral for our times. One more long-term example. Pericles' notorious citizenship law of 451 to naught what Josine Bloch has recently abbreviated as the PCL, Periclean Citizenship Law. PCL prescribes that only sons whose parents are both of Athenian citizen birth should be given Athenian citizenship. Why? Modern explanations of the law allege a concern to limit state benefits, or they call the law racist. Ancient ones suggest there was a fear that excess numbers of people were swamping the city. The crucial question is whether the law was to be effective at once on all existing children or only to apply to children born thenceforwards. I firmly believe the latter, and by 450, non-Athenian wives were no longer confined to a few internationally-minded aristocrats. The Athenians in their assembly would never have voted for a law which would at once take the vote away from so many in citizenship from so many of their own family's existing sons. It was to be prospective, looking forwards, not retrospective, looking back. What inspired it? Josine Bloch has proposed that it was to ensure that in future all holders of Athenian priesthoods would be pure-born Athenians, especially, she believes, as some of the Athenian priesthoods were now to be distributed at random by lot. However, very few such allotted priesthoods are really known, and even the best-known example of the change actually appears to lie far ahead in the 420s. I believe the law was linked to quite a different plan, one known to have been forming with Pericles and others in 450. The plan to send so many more adult Athenians than ever before out to landholdings all over the Athenian Empire. When abroad, whether as landlords or actual residents, they were so likely to marry foreign girls. If they did, then Athenian daughters at home would be left with less chance of a prospective Athenian husband. Very well, but if the foreign migrants did so, thenceforward, the Athenians are saying, their children will not have the prized Athenian citizenship. These emigrants, we know, were about to multiply from 449 onwards, so in 450, 
a prospective law looked 18 years ahead when the first new batch of future sons, including sons of these new migrants, would be presented for Athenian citizenship. Such a law has nothing to do with curbing citizen numbers, racism, or recipients of benefits. For these purposes, it had needed to be effective at once, not 18 years ahead. Nor was it to curb the enfranchisement of bastard sons fathered by citizens on their slave girls. Even before the law, and certainly afterwards, such bastard sons were not legally given Athenian citizenship anyway. The citizenship law, PCL, is a truly long-term law. It exemplifies the very thinking before acting, which the Periclean funeral speech applauds. Once, and once only, the speech dwells explicitly on democracy. How? The Athenian state is a free society, Pericles insists. It is called a democracy, on the one hand, even states, and then goes on, often mistranslated, in it, nobody will be preeminent, simply apomerus, only for reasons of faction or a particular clique, rather than for talent, arete. But equally, poverty is not a barrier to political participation. I've given you on number 4A the text and the translation of Hornblower's recent commentary, which is, I think, wrong, although based on a widely accepted alternative. As for the Athenians, Pericles goes on in 4B over Leaf, they either judge or, sorry, they either judge, at least, gay again, or they think affairs through as well. And again, I give Hornblower's recent translation as an example, and it usefully misses the meaning. What Pericles says is that at Athens, everyone decides at the very least, but some people think things over in more detail first. This procedure is a model of good government. It is consistent, too, with the model expressed by Protagoras in Plato's famous dialogue. Protagoras, we know, was a friend of Pericles, an admirer of his emotional self-control. Protagoras was also the man who drew up the law code for the new Athenian colony of Thurii, sent west in the Periclean mid-440s. In this political context, Pericles goes on. We help others without calculation of self-interest. As the 18th century English author Lawrence Stern well puts it, we do not love men so much for the good they have done as for the good we have done them. Tolstoy even used and acknowledged Stern's remark in War and Peace, but Stern, I believe, was inspired directly by Pericles' words. <clears throat> Athenians do not make friends, Pericles is telling us, out of self-interest. But what, many people say, about all those examples of exactly the opposite in Thucydides' histories, which, after all, stress self-interest as the basis for Athenian alliances and interstate relations? But they do not, I believe, undercut Pericles' remark. For Pericles, I suggest, is not thinking of foreign alliances at all. He is thinking of friendships with individuals within the Athenian polis. It is a fine ideal, the pleasure of helping other Athenians, not least, Pericles says, but not, Pericles says, for the favours they can do for us. So here are already Periclean values. Think long term, propose, try to persuade, and everyone involved is to decide and, if possible, help one another. Those who do not participate in decisions are, rightly, useless, just as, for instance, those in a university department are indeed useless, who are always mysteriously on leave when examiners are needed each summer. <laughs> in return for their public political duties, Athenians of the Periclean age are rewarded. They are rewarded by payments from the state, for jury service, of course, and service on the council. Why? 
it should be emphasised that the principle of payments from the state to citizens had begun before Pericles, i.g. 1 cube 6, certainly by the 470s, with payments made to children whose fathers had died in war. Pericles, I suggest, extended the military men's idea. Payments henceforward were to be made not to the poor as poor or orphans, but in return for political service. As with friendship and decision-making, Pericles' view throughout is communitarian. He's speaking up for the collectivity, rightly. He's not collectivist, a word with such sinister Stalinist undertones. Famously, he recognises the freedom of Athenians in their personal life. It is not a freedom to do just anything, he tells us, because the laws, and interestingly shame, are sanctions on Athenians' behaviour. But within those limits, there is, he tells us, a cardinal freedom from, a freedom from intrusion. It's a freedom enjoyed without hostility from fellow Athenians, so long as all play their political part. This is in no way totalitarian. Athenians, he remarks, will not presume to tell others, in modern terms, how to manage every hour of their time, let alone how to conduct their personal lives. It is the first known expression in history of a liberal ideal. And Sir John Beasley drew a fine parallel here with the procession and those horsemen sculpted on the Periclean uh, contemporary Parthenon frieze. They show, I quote Beasley, a union of common aims and individual freedom in an order which never breaks down, though looking constantly as if it would. Computerised study of the ranks of those sculpted horsemen now in London has supported Beasley's eye. As that great frieze reminds us, Athenians had so many different skills. As Pericles well puts it, they were versatile, and this versatility was the effect of living in a free constitution. They do so, he tells us, with graces. In modern terms, they are not brash. They profit, he tells us, from their city's many festivals. Despite the silence of Aristophanes, I accept that Pericles did introduce another state benefit, the payment, the famous Tothe Oricon, to each citizen to buy a theatre ticket for the city's dramatic festivals. He also proposed, of course, the new Odeon, which was to stand just below the Acropolis, the site of musical contests, part of the same planned artistic formation of the Athenian citizenry. Scholars have been far too quick to trust Plutarch's vague allegation that the Odeon was modelled on the captured tent of the king of Persia, Xerxes, and treated as evidence for the Athenians' Orientalism or for their Persian-style imperialism. The comment, I believe, is simply a joke, missed by Plutarch, but made in a comedy comparing Pericles to a Persian ruler. He was no such thing. Pericles believed in the civilising power of the arts. He didn't want a city with the single-mindedness of modern German university education or the brashness of some American ones not represented here tonight. We are lovers of beauty, he tells us, yes, but with economy. We are lovers of wisdom, yes, but without softness. Here, surely, he is answering contemporary critics, critics who exaggerated the costs of the building programme, as did our fourth century sources, and critics who thought abstract discussion was effete and soft. For Pericles, by contrast, the Athenians were special and were to be rewarded for being active citizens. Pericles is the first politician who is known to have associated closely with leading intellectuals. He picked up their progressive ideas. He had a new idea of a city-state, what the great Burckhardt detected in early Renaissance Italy, and famously called the state as a work of art. But Pericles had anticipated the Italians, and that, above all, is what was Periclean in Periclean Athens. Pericles took no salary. He cost nothing. 
He was also way above corruption, as Thucydides emphasizes. The very model for the next Greek leader, we hope, uncorrupt, intelligent, persuasive, who will bring this dear country back from his financial and moral crisis. In his finest era, remember, Athens had no prime minister, no political parties, no five-year programs, not even a government. Instead, like every yearly office holder, Pericles was the object of the ancient Greek principle which we have ignored at such peril. External scrutiny and accountability for whatever be spent during a magistrate's year of office. What, lastly, about those women? Here, Sophocles, Pericles' friend, must have the last word. In his superb play, The Antigone, Sophocles was considered by the late Professor Ehrenberg to be delivering a rebuke to Pericles' outlook. Like the tyrant Creon, Ehrenberg argued, Pericles looked on his own pronouncements as if they were laws. He regarded decisions of state, in Ehrenberg's view, as overriding the unwritten laws, including the unwritten duty appealed to by Antigone to bury one's brother, even if he had died as a traitor. Ehrenberg was writing still in the dark shadow of Nazi Germany, and he is interestingly wrong. Like Antigone, Pericles would never have considered the tyrant Creon's pronouncements to be laws, nomoi, despite his Theban citizens' clear opposition. Like Antigone, Pericles too recognised the force of unwritten laws, unwritten laws, he tells us, which constrain Athenians' personal conduct. In other Athenian funeral speeches, it was customary, even in Aspasia's, to cite the distant mythical past, and in it to emphasise the Athenians' valiant intervention at Thebes against the tyrannical Creon. Athenian audiences were familiar with these speeches. They were certainly not on Creon's side in Sophocles' play. Like them too, Pericles would have acknowledged Antigone's rightful action. But, like the play's chorus, he would surely have been unsettled by that awesome intransigence which made her a woman even worse than her existing nature and the subject of political praise and blame, taking others with her to the grave. That very tension, the rightness of Antigone's case but the awesomeness of her female obstinacy is the tension at the heart of Sophocles' play. It is not anti-Periclean, it is a dynamic which Pericles could accommodate. But what, finally, of the women who actually heard Pericles speak? I can't answer for them in 431, but I assume his advice to them in 431 is similar to advice which he would have given in that funeral speech of 439. Then we do know their response from Plutarch's contemporary sources. In 439, when Pericles came down from the speaker's platform, he tells us, the women showered him with flowers and garlands as if he was an athlete. After all, as he told them, they were keen not to be worse than their existing nature, at such moments, ladies and gentlemen, the Athenians are both near to us and still enigmatically far from us. But lit by Pericles, their ideals still help us too to be better than our untutored selves. Thank you. Thank you.